Hello, there are loads of empty seats, so there's people standing around here. There's literally a load of empty seats if you want to get comfortable. I'll be talking about product management in a growing company. So, very, very brief background on me, co founder of Intercom. We started in August 2011. Today we have four to 5,000 customers and, uh, you know, 100 plus people. And we did it while making. I guess a lot of right decisions and mostly wrong decisions along the way. And what we'd like, what this presentation covers mostly is the lessons I learned personally about how to manage a product when everything else is growing. So to go back a little bit, this is what the world looked like when I was a teenager. This was maybe two, well, no, I'm joking. <laughs> this was like 90, 92 to maybe, I guess, 99. Um, if you wanted to listen to music, you would put on a CD into a single purpose device and you'd play it and you'd sit on your bed and that was that. And if you wanted to read the news, you'd buy this newspaper device and you'd read it. This is actually the world today, basically. Uh, what we're doing today is everything looks like this. It's headphones on, it's hand on mouse, it's all this arthritis ridden posture that we have. Uh, this is the world. It's actually. Even this is a little out of date, it's a little bit more like this. Uh, we all just stand around on our phones. Uh, you can see it absolutely everywhere you go. Even stock photography models are doing this full time for photo shoots. Uh, so the way I think about it, using an app on your phone is effectively the new smoking a cigarette. When our parents were growing up, they were, you know, they were all told smoking is cool, that's what all the young people do. And they'd go to the, maybe the theater where it wasn't allowed, and then they'd leave. And the first thing they do is they'd light up and go, <sighs> and we think we're so much different leaving the theater and lighting up and going, <sighs> someone favorited my tweet. I'm obviously kicking ass today. So I, I can only expect we're going to see some sort of reports to tell us how bad mobile phones are for our health, like as if we don't know. Um, one change that's significant between when I was a teenager and today, and this slide comes courtesy of Benedict Evans from Andreessen, is the number of people online is significantly different. In 2000, there was maybe 400 million people online. Today, as you can see, we're just under 3 billion people, the majority of which also have a smartphone. There are, to put it simply, a shitload of people online. So what's new about that? Well. There's a few things that have changed along the way here. Growing a user base is actually easier than ever. The number of people online, as we've just seen, is significant. The rate at which software is adopted is significant. The number of smartphones out there and the capability, what they can actually do, is all shooting up. While at the same time, the cost to create software, thanks to things like free IDEs, thanks to Amazon's AWS services, etc., is all plummeting. The complexity of going to market, you used to have to put CDs or floppy disks into a big box with a manual and shrink wrap it and put it onto a shelf in you know, a PC store where people would hopefully buy it. Today you upload it to Apple and you're done. And the time to traction as a result has also changed. So interestingly, a cool new app that launches, and this could be any of the apps we have out here, and Lord knows there are a few of them. Getting to a million users is just the new norm. Keeping them and getting to the 100 million, that's something. But launching and getting a million users is actually not that big a deal anymore. And when you think of the products that launch and hit a, a million, I'll show you some. Some make it, some don't. Yo launched opening day, I think just under a million users and a million dollars raised. Meerkat launched. I went on a holiday. I came back. Not only had Meerkat launched, Periscope had launched. And I was reading an article saying that Meerkat might not be able to survive Periscope. This is how quickly shit moves, right? Uh, obviously, Periscope launched. We're probably familiar with the end of Secret. They had a million users. Whisper has a million users. Slack has quite a few users. In fact, it's interesting to look at Slack's growth. Uh, this is Slack's daily active user chart. And let's just have a look at it. This will bring us up to February of this year, by the way. Um, it keeps going. There's a little dip because we all take two days off Slack for Christmas. And it keeps going and going. And where they are today, I mean, Lord knows where they are today, but like in February 2015, we're looking at half a million people every day using this product. So 
Another thing that's changed, so along with all these users, the amount of people we actually need to build a product that gets this big is actually much smaller than it used to be too. WhatsApp is now bigger than the entire SMS system. They send more than 8 trillion messages a year. So you immediately think that they must have some sort of WhatsApp megacorp towers where they have like thousands and thousands of people. This is how quickly SMS was killed by WhatsApp, or like effectively killed, the space of four years. And they did all that with a team of 30. So that would be like if this got group over here banded together and said, let's bring down SMS. That's about as many people as you need to do it. Shocking. So Slack achieved this half a million uh, people every, si every single day using it as of February, 100 people. So the point is that very, big, very small teams with very big ideas can achieve massive traction. And there's some points that fall out of that, and that's what I'm going to talk about now. One of them is you have to, to do this, to execute this strategy, you have to fight hard against feature creep. So here's what traction looks like. This is like the simplified version of the Slack graph that we just saw, okay? You get a lot of users over time if your product has reached some form of product market fit. And it'd be cool if it just stopped there, but actually what happens is everything else increases over time too. The vision you have for your product, the number of competitors you have, the size of your board or invested parties, the size of your team, the amount of press coverage, and all of these things feed into things that you need to build as soon as possible because the founders have ideas. The competitors will have competing features. Your customers will ask for things. Your advisors, mentors, or investors will suggest or nod or prod you in ways around things. Your product team alone, who are probably the most important people, they'll have ideas. The press will be telling you things like, oh, this is what's coming next in the space. Forest will have white papers. And your biggest customers will be offering you a lot of money to pay more for certain features. And if you do all of this, you're in trouble. You'll effectively build something like this. The Swiss Army knife, right? Now, the thing is, the Swiss Army knife is actually quite a beautiful device. Uh, they have like, you know, amazing Swiss designers. You probably don't. You're actually going to build this, <laughs> the file matrix. It has every feature Lord has ever thought of. But the interesting thing about file matrix is no one ever sat down and said, hey, I've got an idea. Let's build a big bloated piece of shit. No one had that idea. What they had was, hey, this is a cool product, guys. I've got one little idea, just one little thing I want to add on. And they'll do it. And you keep doing it. And eventually, you end up here. So what does feature creep actually look like? Because we can all, you know, we're all familiar with ideas about it. Like, oh, it's the Microsoft Word toolbar with all those options, or it's the file matrix. A simple way to know if you're heading there is to ask questions like this. How many people are using this feature? And how often are they using it? This is two very simple axes. Some of the people, some of the time. All of the people, all of the time. And for any given product, you should be able to answer these questions. So you can map your features out. Just as a side note, at the very end, I will give away an email address where you can get all these slides, because I understand I'm going to move pretty fast. But like, feel free to keep taking photos. But just so you know, you will get a full deck. Uh, so for example, a project management tool might have things like, what are people, all people doing all the time? Well, they're probably posting messages and uploading files and that sort of stuff. Um, and then you might look at something like, say, the time tracker, which is top middle. And only some people are using that, but they depend on it heavily. And that's where you start to wonder, well, wh what's going on there? Why doesn't everyone like this feature? What's wrong with it? Could we make it better? So this is how you can think of your features. Your core product is buried in the top right. For Instagram, this might be upload a photo. For Twitter, it might be post a tweet or read a timeline or whatever. If you have a lot of features in the bottom left, you're tiptoeing towards consulting wear. That is, you're building features maybe for one-off use cases that aren't really uh, typical or reflective of your target user, but you're doing it because someone said, hey, I'll give you an extra grand a month if you do it. It's not a great way to run product. So what does a well-rounded product look like? And by this, I mean something that's not feature creeped. Well, if we just simplify this graph for a second and say, what percentage of users have used this feature? And for use, we can say maybe it's once a week or maybe it's like 30 times a day or whatever, whatever is appropriate in terms of typical user behavior. So most products, including all of yours, will start somewhere around here. Most people use all the features you've built. That's usually what some people could call product market fit itself. Like, you know, we've built a set of features and everyone values them. And you get a few users, you get a little bit of traction, so you think, oh, obviously I can do no wrong here. Uh, 
So you start adding to it. And you're like, all right, here we go. Uh, we'll, we'll throw in calendars, we'll throw in time tracking, we'll throw in invoicing and reports and live chat and message tagging. And the thing is, in your head, this is what you're building. This is what you're doing. You're like, you're in Photoshop or you're in Sketch or some design tool, and you're like, everyone's going to love all of the things I do. And it's just like, you have not put a foot wrong yet. The reality is a little bit messier. The reality is something more like this. You have a few hits, a few misses. And even this is an optimistic version of reality because the wider this graph gets, the more like that file matrix it looks, which means that even your core offering, the thing that made you popular, starts to get tricky to use too. So that comes down too. Now you're looking like file matrix, except for unlike funny screenshots, this is something you can actually check, right? So to keep a product simple, you have to say no to anything that isn't your core. So a good way to do this is to have on your whiteboard, in your office, in your Slack channel, whatever, a set of questions to which the answer must be yes all the way across the board. Otherwise, the feature does not get built. Does it fit in our vision? And so you might have a project management tool and someone might suggest that you build a visualization tool on top of it or, or Gantt charts or something like this. There'll be margin calls you will make. You will fight with your co-founders, you'll fight with your PMs, and you'll say, you know, the way I see the world and the way I see this product, this is just not a part of it. And it's easy to say a project management tool shouldn't have, you know, angry birds inside it. We can all agree that's like that's not being a visionary, that's just not being a Muppet. Uh, what I'm really talking about here is the hard calls, the ones where it's a knife edge. You don't know, but your gut tells you one way or the other. A simple way to think about it is if you're not saying no because of your vision, you don't have a vision yet. Will this feature matter in five years? It's incredibly easy to like, think that we have to integrate with every new thing we see on Product Hunt. We have to integrate with Product Hunt itself. We have to do like, you know, every single, you know, back in the day it used to be like, oh, we'll build a Facebook app or a Bebo app or whatever. The thing is, you know, you have your product core will be around in five years. The things you integrate with may or may not, but make that decision consciously. Don't just let it happen to you. A simple way to put this from Jeff Bezos is to focus on the things that don't change. So uh, I love this screenshot, or this photo, sorry, uh, uh, where we have five different people using five different generations of technology, if you like, and they're all doing the exact same thing. You're reading a book, we've got somebody who's like reading on their phone, a Kindle, a different type of phone, I guess, and a MacBook. Uh, and people often use screenshots like this to say how, how antisocial technology makes us. Like as if this isn't a new thing of sorts, right? People have been bored on commutes for as long as there have been commutes and people. It's not a fun thing to sit still. So the key point I'm making here is that the job has not changed. Focus on the things that don't change. Another question is, does it benefit all customers? So it's easy to get confused with what we call like a frequency bias. That is, a feature request you have heard frequently, you'll confuse with something you hear recently, or, uh, or what a lot will lead to is when you sit down and go back to your team, you're like, you know what, I was just back from collision and three different people have talked about this thing, so obviously we have to build it. Yeah, cool. Three people is not a reflective sample of your entire user base. It's just three good examples. And you have that overwhelming human empathy because you saw the wide eyes of your customers. They're like, I just think it'd be really cool if you could add photo filters. And you're like, oh, I've got it. I'm going to make you happy. So you run off and like, next thing, photo filters have bypassed any sort of product vision, any sort of product research, any sort of like, you know, feature backlog, and they just jump straight to the top of the queue. Why? Because three people ask for it. Don't fall for the frequency bias. Another way to put, put this is like act on the requests of your customers. But uh, sorry, not, act not under requests, but act on their behalf. They will ask you for things that are not as important as the things that they need, and you have to be aware of that. A uh, simple way of putting this is that our customers will often point us to the moon, and we'll examine their fingers along the way, and we'll go and ship a minimum viable finger, totally missing what they're actually saying. Um, another good question is, will it improve, complement, or innovate upon any existing features we have? Because if you're just building whole new lateral units to your product, how are these things connected together? How does it fit in the workflow of your users? Is it just like you have this extra tab called Angry Birds inside your, your invoicing tool? Like it has to be part of a workflow. Occasionally you'll hear, well, we, we've tested this out and the data looks good, people are using it. Uh, and that can be true, but it's easy to confuse action in a new feature uh, with 
uh, progress. It does not necessarily add up. For example, if Facebook let us split groups into three different categories, would they get more groups or not is a question. The answer potentially is no. Similarly, if Facebook shipped an unlike feature or a dislike or a sympathize button, would they get more engagement? Well, maybe not because everyone just writes instead of clicking it. So there's no new engagement here. A simple human real world example of this is Diet Coke with Lime. So Diet Coke launched Diet Coke with Lime. And somewhere in Atlanta, a product manager was really impressed. He was like, hey, we had no customers yesterday. We just launched Diet Coke with Lime, and now we've got lots of customers. So obviously, I did my job, right? And somewhere else in Atlanta, the PM of Diet Coke is going, what is after happening? We're just after losing a fair few customers. Like 10% of our customer base has just disappeared. We better go research that. Meanwhile, the CEO of Coke is like, all right, well, everything's just the same. We've, you know, we haven't really had any success of any of these projects. And you might think, oh, well, that's just a break even. It's not a break even. You've got all this fucking lime now, right? You have all these limers and you have all this whole, you've done all these campaigns and you're, you've basically forked all of your engagement with no new engagement and no new benefits. And that's what we call, you know, that's the danger of side effects. And be careful to do that in your product because you will launch new features. And guess what? People will click them. The question is, is that new behavior or is that just cannibalizing old behavior? If it takes off, can you afford it? So the, the classic one here is like, hey, we'll just hire a consultancy and they'll build an Android app. I hear this all the time. And that's cool. That makes sense. It's just if people actually use that Android app, you can't support it. So now you're in trouble. Uh, so what are you going to do? Hire, hire a load of Android developers. Well, now you, can you afford those Android developers? Well, that's a different question, right? It might feel good to have a quick win by rolling out a quick beta or something like that, but it's not like future facing. Can we design it so that the reward for usage is greater than the effort required. So things, some things are hard to do and some things are easy to do. And some things give you a lot back and some things don't. If you consider to say Instagram filters, they give you a lot back because they make you look good uh, and they take no effort because it's just a swipe. That's a really great feature. People love it because it takes no effort from them and they get a lot out of it. Some things are high, high effort, high reward. Writing a really good email to your team that's going to uh, that's going to like you know motivate them or going to update them on an important issue. That takes a lot of effort, but you get the results out of it. You want to watch out for the other two. Admin tasks are like you know please configure your account settings. No one really wants to do that. It's not a lot of fun. There's like you know it, you have to work out a way to try and get them to do it, but it's tricky. Uh, and gimmicks and novelty are in the like you know low effort, low reward. So it's like you know liking a, an update or connecting to somebody on LinkedIn or something like that. They're kind of in that category. Circles is like that, by the way, as an example. I would go back, but I'm not sure if that button will do it. Uh, Google Circles offered you the ability to organize all your friends into different social circles and keep that up to date for as long as you want. The danger is that like, that's, the reward isn't as great as the effort of managing all my friends in different social circles all the time. Like I've met, made friends at this conference. I would have to go back and update all my friendship relationships. I'm not bothered doing that. That's one of the dangers of these things. Uh, an obvious point is that if you can't do something well, it's not a good feature. So it's easy to move into areas where you don't have the domain expertise. Uh, but your customers will ask for it because it is part of their workflow. If you do it, you're going to be basically delivering half a solution to something you don't really understand. Your customers won't adopt it, but now you have this extra feature inside your product. It's one of the ones that doesn't get a lot of adoption. None of these are good reasons to ship bad software. And you will hear them all the time in product meetings. Hey guys, this one's really, really, really late. We better ship it. How did that work out for Windows Vista? You know, uh, we've worked on it for quite a while. How did that work out for Windows Vista? <laughs> uh, we've talked about it forever. So what? That's not a relevant thing to say when you're talking about whether or not it's a good addition to a product or not. Uh, we can produce it quickly. I can rob a bank pretty quickly. Does not mean it's a good career move. The speed at which you can do something has nothing to do with whether or not it's a good idea. So w one last thing I'll say is, it might seem like I'm saying here, these are all reasons to say no. Like These are all perishable decisions. You don't say never, you say no, or you say not now. You say like, all right, we're not going to have this discussion again for six months. In six months time, a lot of this might have changed. But for now, the answer is no. And you can timestamp your decisions to make sure that you are open to revisiting when appropriate, but that you're not like, you know, you know having cyclical debates every week about whether we should add this or not. So. One interesting thing is that there's long-term and short-term implications for the product decisions you make. 
and it's very, very easy to make something that looks like it boosts engagement, but in practice, you're just swapping a long-term ow for a short-term wow. So the most canonical example I experience frequently is LinkedIn itself, uh, where they've made it incredibly easy to connect with people regardless of whether or not you know anything about them. And this comic, I think, is a really good example because it's like, uh, since you're a person I trust, I'd like to invite you to enjoy my network on LinkedIn. And we all get these all the time. LinkedIn have excelled at making it easy to connect with people even if you have literally z zero in common with them. And in doing so, they've created a product opportunity and it's, your pitch would be something like this. It's like LinkedIn, but for people you're actually professionally connected to. And that's a compelling offering at this point. If you don't cut these features, you'll turn into one of those products that people have to remove all the junk out of just so that they can use what's left. And I love this example because my first reaction to this remote control thing was like, ah, that's hilarious. And then I was like, actually, I should really do that because my, my remotes confused the hell out of me. Another thing to bear in mind is it's really hard to take something back. So rolling out features is easy in comparison with, with withdrawing them. Here's roughly how customers will value a hypothetical feature. Would you like an invoice tracker in our tool? Sure I would. Okay, here's an invoice tracker in your tool. Uh, I don't care. Okay, we'll take it back. What? Right? That's roughly how it goes. Customers, like, you know, it's really tricky to take things back. So as a result, most companies don't do it, which is how the product just gets miles wide and inches deep. Great companies are, can be seen frequently to kill things. And customers don't like this, but it's the right decision. On the far left here, we have Steve Jobs in front of the iPod jukebox. Uh, I think it was called jukebox. That product lasted seven months and 22 days on the market before he was like, get that thing off the shelves because it is going nowhere and we are not supporting it. Google have a graveyard of products, as do Facebook. When things aren't working out, you make hard calls. So when you're looking at your roadmap, you should have four types of work you concentrate on. You should be either improving the features in your products, getting more people to use the features in your products, getting people to use your features more, or lastly, and more rarely than the first three, new features to support new workflows. And when you do that, you be careful and you run through those questions. Focus on engagement. So going back to our earlier diagram, we have how many people are using this? Well, simple questions to ask are, you know, we should either increase the frequency of this time tracker, get people to use it more, or increase its adoption, get more people using it. A product team that measures its success through code shipped or ships per day is like a parent measuring their success through presents purchased. It's a really bad proxy that encourages bad behavior. And related to us, beware of marginal thinking. None of these things seem like a big deal when you take them one at a time. But if you take them 10 at a time, you can realize whether they're bad. However, you, you, no one ever decides, here, let's add 10 bad ideas. They just decide to add one, and they're like, ah, oh, we got away with that one. Let's do one more, and one more. And that's when you end up in trouble. The marginal cost of doing it just as once, it always looks negligible. But when it goes wrong, and as you saw with the file matrix example, you pay the full cost, not the marginal cost. And lastly, revisit your old assumptions. So I'm going to close on this point. Startups move incredibly fast, like incredibly fast. Like I was on holiday, who are these six new people? Why did we move all our files out of Asana? What's going on over here and where's my desk? That's the sort of rough speed that startups move at, uh, at this sort of breakneck speed. And you make all of these crazy decisions along the way. You have every single day as decisions, decisions, decisions. Should we, will we, why don't we? Let's stop this, let's start that. And you take this path. Every single way you make a choice and when you think backwards about like the road that got you here, it's really easy to sort of do something like this, to forget all the junctions. And then you present your story. And if you watch movies like The Social Network, they present it as this linear like A, a to B sort of thing. Like, of course, success was inevitable. Uh, and if we, you, know, you just know that like we, you're ignoring all of the weird junctures at which things could have gone horrendously wrong. And we use this to plan our products. This is we, we think the future is going to look just as brilliantly as our superstitious view of the past. So we have Gantt charts that assume that we'll never have to go back and remove a feature or that we'll never, like, nothing will ever go wrong in some future world where everyone uses everything I code. And uh, it's a dangerous assumption. 
because all the while, as, I'm sorry for the state of these slides at this point, uh, aesthetically they're not great, uh, all the while you're getting smarter. You know more about your target domain, you know, know more about your customers, you know more about your team, your company, your capabilities. And which means that you're much smarter today than you were when you started. So the decision you made when you started, like let's never do this or let's always do that, doesn't mean it was the right decision. You know a lot more now. When you get new information, you can change your opinion. And if you have to act on that change. So good questions to ask are, if you knew then what you know now, would you still have built that feature? Would you still have chose that architecture, shipped that integration, hired that person, designed that screen, picked that title, chosen that vertical? These are all questions. And like the key point for me is, you know, you'll make these mistakes and you have to correct them. Lord knows we have made plenty of mistakes in Intercom uh, and we've just had to correct them. Here's dead features. This is our auto message creator workflow. My favorite piece about this, by the way, is this little, if all of this wasn't enough for you, there's a little advanced button down the bottom. Lord knows what's in there. Uh, we had a beautiful user gallery. Again, it was a cool idea. Didn't get used, had to go. We had a revenue visualizer. Again, nice idea, didn't get used, gotta go. None of these features are idiotic decisions. We weren't like having a brainstorm of, hey guys, come up with the dumbest shit you can do. They made sense to us at the time, but they're dead now. Hindsight gets a bad rap, but it is actually the best sight you have. You know way more looking back. So one final point I'll leave you with is that the mistakes that you know about in your company or in your product or in your life, the ones that you know about and don't correct, they're the ones you're making every single day. We're at a time when very small teams with very big ideas can achieve massive traction so long as they avoid feature creep, focus on usage, and revisit old assumptions. If you enjoyed this talk, the address for the slides is des-slides at intercom.io. I'm at Des Trainer. Our product is Intercom. I'd love you to go check it out. I specifically don't speak about it in presentations. Our blog is Intercom. We also wrote a book along with a lot of these ideas. That's for free if you want to go check it out. I hope you found the session useful. Thank you very much. So do we have any questions for Des? Put your hand up. Got one over here. Good stuff. Anybody over here? Hi. Hey, you didn't mention the implication of testing in the development of the product. Uh, I'm not necessarily talking about A-B testing or, or all these kind of things, but just something simple like you want to launch a new, a new type of business on your web page, you create a tab and you measure the clicks. Uh, wh what are your views on this? How long should you activate this tab uh, to get, gather enough data to know if this project might work? Is it a good strategy to do? Okay, so the question is around testing and uh, how, how you should basically uh, test or evaluate something before you commit to it, right? Uh, so I think th the best way to roll features out, in my opinion, is not to do it like uh, in a big bang, sort of like, hey, everyone, you all get this. Uh, a good way to do it is roll it out internally. Ideally, like you'll know yourself internally if it's built well, and that should help you catch all the stupid like low-level things. But then I also suggest companies keep a group of like trusted testers, which are people who are willing to try stuff that you might take off, uh, but that's part of their deal. Like, they, like that you will give them access to stuff that's not yet complete or committed to, but you want to observe their behavior as they do it. And if in Intercom, if something does not get through to trusted testers, it does not get into their product. So their, like their job is to adopt it. Like we, we want to see who adopts this feature into their workflow. And if a large percentage of them don't, it's usually a big alarm bell that we've got something wrong. So that, that's how I see testing, is that once you've decided like, that you're going to try something, you don't just like, throw it out there for everyone. You're very careful and meticulous about, first of all, it's the team. Then it's the company. Then it's the trusted testers. And at that point, you'll then know you know, you'll know a lot more. You'll know like what sort of usage you, do, you should expect, if you should charge for it, how you should charge for it, when you should charge for it, how to promote it. Ideally, you'll be getting like sample use cases back from these trusted testers, and you can use that to market the feature. But yeah, you have to be incredibly careful about how you roll something out. Does that answer your question? Cool. Any other questions? Going, going. Gone. Oh, just at the last minute. So you touched on the point of 
basically building features for clients as they ask for it. So obviously as kind of you're creating the whole platform, it's easy to run down rabbit holes for certain clients. But then you're also talking about how sometimes they can circle back and cannibalize or facilitate. Um, how can you determine if that cannibalization is g like a good, good thing? Yeah. So the question is, you might roll something out and it might basically cannibalize all the engagement of something else that you had. And is that a good thing? And like broadly speaking, if it cannibalizes 100%, it's basically, it can only be a better version of the same thing because people wouldn't switch otherwise. Uh, so the more nuanced questions are like, when it cannibalizes a lot of it, but not all of it, but it also has new users that the other feature didn't have. And that's when you have purely like forked your engagement. Uh, so in terms of evaluation, like it'll come down to like your basic vision of like, you know, sometimes like there are other things going on here. It'll be like, you know, underlying architectural choices that you've made that you, you, you kind of want to get rid of old code and replace it with new code as well. But the top level decision is if you roll out something that is attracting more users, but not all users, you now have two different things. You now have to basically kill the old feature and promote the new feature. What you will end up probably having to do is either losing a few users because you, it's not a good idea to back two horses. It'll confuse the shit out of your users. Uh, so you either pick one of them and kill it, probably the old one if, if the new one's being more successful, and then you'll have to kind of improve on it along a trajectory that hopefully meets the old use case. It's, it's exactly why I'd say be careful as hell about doing these things because the worst case scenario is you now have like two competing features with, like, with, with marginal differences that people have strong opinions about. And like, that's a horrible place. If you have like two different ways to send an invoice in your invoicing tool, that's a mess because your, your new users are going to be confused. The one thing you can do to sort of save yourself a little bit is decide whichever one you're going to ultimately move away from and stop showing it to new users Stop showing it to people who've never used it at all. At all. Uh, then I ultimately make a plan for sunsetting that feature and, my, and offer migration paths towards the new one. That's the best you can do. Any other questions? Ooh. So with the, uh, the product management approach, how do you fit uh, user experience into that as a practice? Because that's sort of like a formal discipline that's emerged all by itself. So getting that to interact with agile development or product management can be a challenge. Yeah, so the question is where does UX fit in, in with a product management team? And uh, the way we're architected, we have a product manager who is ultimately responsible for the state of any given one of our products. We have designer who leads the design for that particular piece of the feature. Uh, all the designers report into our design lead who's responsible for the overall experience of the product. And the way they work together is ultimately it's the designer's job to make sure that the, the feature we design meets the user needs with the required level of user experience quality that we insist on across the intercom. It's the product manager's job to make sure that, that the, the product actually goes out on, you know, and uh, to evaluate how the users adopt it and understand the use cases. Uh, I personally don't advise on a hierarchy between the two. I think they're like, they're, you know, a UX person or the visual designer or any sort of designer, they're, they're experts in their own domain, just like a PM should be an expert in theirs. And I, I, don't, I don't like the world where one tells the other person what to do. They, ha they have different jobs ultimately, and it's important to keep it that way. Just a quick question around, uh, I suppose, feature creep. So you talked about there just, you know, I, I suppose having your blinders on and just getting that product out to market. I mean, when you're a brand new company and you want to get your product out to market as quickly as possible and you've got a lot of people saying, well, what about this feature or did you think about this vertical? I mean, d d did you just get your blinders on and say, I'm going to just get my product out that I have a passion on and ignore everything else? Uh, short answer. So the question is, like, when you're actually instantiating your product for the very first time, when you're creating it, when you're starting up, what relevance does any of this have, I guess, right? Uh, for me, I, I honestly think like your, the first work you produce will be primarily your vision about the world and how well you execute on, that, on like a product that fits in that vision. And I think anything else is just going to be secondary noise. And you, I, I honestly would advise that you keep your head down and create what you want to create. The, it, I don't like people who do like an incredible amount of market research. They've got loads of conflicting customers. They, you know, they have this whole wealth of things, but they don't have a product. Because like, basically, if you listen to too much noise, you're not gonna be. You're gonna end up like trying to design like a jack of all trades, and it will truly be a master of none. 
if you have, you know, if you are, if you're hitting on something amazing, like if you're doing like, hey, I'm gonna do like Spotify, but for streaming soccer, right? Cool idea. Uh, obviously, everyone will want it, and they'll all be aligned behind that exact idea. Then yeah, that's great. But like most of the time, most products, like you know, it's like gonna be a messaging app, and you're gonna believe that some people will like something, and a lot of people you talk to won't, and they're not experts. They're just giving you their good opinion. So, my honest advice is, when you're starting up, keep your keep, you know, keep your blinders on, keep your focus strong and execute on whatever it is that you want to create and then you start managing it but only start like the opening point of this i'll talk was like as you hit traction right you don't have traction you don't like none of this shit matters you can get all this stuff right and if you've got no users no one gives a shit so uh like it's m first and foremost your first version has to be you so i i have a question you talked about product features and how you can try to add them and not be honest when you should back off of them, but you also talked about workflows, or let's say experience flows. How do you know when you might be forcing a feature into a workflow because you want that feature so bad, but it could be diminishing the overall workflow even though you're trying to justify it by it being a part of a workflow? So the question is, if you're adding a feature into a particular workflow uh, because you want it, uh, but it's basically something that you're forcing in that your users don't want it. How do you know? The answers are kind of the old school techniques in my opinion. Uh, one thing you should do a lot for any given workflow you have is it should be instrumented so you should know what the completion ratio of somebody who wants to create a product or add their friends or like send an invoice. You should know how many people try to do it every day, how many people finish doing it every day. If you've put a big fat useless step in the middle, you'll see a big drop in engagement or you'll see no one engaging in this feature. That's usually a good sign that, that, uh, that you haven't done anything useful. Um, sometimes it won't be so obvious because it'll be an optional thing and you can lie to yourself and say, well, no one needed to do it yet. Uh, the best thing to do there is classic user research. So I'd say talk to people who are at that step in the flow and say, hey, just out of curiosity, does this feature make sense? And they'll probably say yes. And then you say, well, when was the last time you needed it? And they'll probably say never. And you know, that, that's the best indication you have, like a mixed sort of qualitative talking to people and quantitative looking at the numbers to see I is this being used or not. Okay, we have, we have to leave it there. Des, thank you very much. If we could have a round of applause for this. Thanks a lot, guys. Um, you might be able to quickly catch them on the way out if you have any <laughs> further questions.